welcome to the Sci Guys, the show where we talk about the crazy, weird, and wonderful stories from the science world. I'm Corey, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Luke Cutfer. Hello. And this week's special guest, the fifth Sci Guy, Noah Finn. Hey! <laughs> This week, we're talking about cookie killers and serial psychopaths. Cookie killers. Cookie, as in like cookie. quirky. Oh, you're a silly little accent. Okay. But first, we have a wee review. This one is five stars. It says, wish I listened sooner. It also goes on to say, I've been a fan of these lovely lads individually for a while, but until recently, I haven't listened to Sci Guys because science has never interested me. <laughs> However, after becoming hooked after listening to the science of gender, these silly boys have proved me wrong, and I can now say that science is very interesting if it's presented <laughs> in the right way. They really do the job of making such complicated things accessible in such a funny and entertaining way. 10 out of 10, would podcast again. Ah, oh, that's very nice. I mean, if ever we need to explain why we do the show, yeah. we can just show that exact review. Do you ever read out, like, two-star reviews? No. Three stars? Well, we don't get those because <laughs> it's impossible. You can only give a five-star. Go and give a five-star and see for yourself. All right, I'll test that one out. And I've got a question for everyone who's watching, listening, and here in the room. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify or anywhere, or else head to YouTube, get down to the comments and answer this question. The question is, have you ever killed a man? Be honest. <laughs> in Sims, in Call of Duty, in Sims, um, maybe Grand Theft Auto, Minecraft. You better watch out, buddy. I once had a dream that I killed a man and I thought I'd actually killed a man for several weeks. Oh, that's very stressful. That's too long to yeah. think that you'd actually killed a man yeah. and it being... I wasn't in a good place. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this, this was the bad time. <laughs> oh, I remember this actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started this episode off in a very, very positive way, which makes sense because today we're talking about serial killers because that's what our patrons voted in. And as we all know, serial killers are a very fun and, and, and cookie little topic for people to get interested in and make edits out of and fan cams and all of that nonsense. Isn't that true? Yeah. Unfortunately. Evidently so. So <laughs> let's get into serial killers, the actual topic here. First off, I want to ask you this question. What is a serial killer? Do not answer Noah. He's not a serial killer. Oh, He's right. just a serial killer. Of I thought you just no, do not answer, answer Noah. Noah. Yeah, someone who kills more than once in a long, in like a chain of killings. I, I, think, I think it's not more than once. Is, is a serial killer, is it like, I'm not sure the exact number that distinguishes you from like a killer or like a mass murderer or a serial killer, but surely a serial killer is like, maybe like five or more. They got like a regular routine of killing. Okay, so this is interesting. You're kind of hitting on all of the right topics here. There are a bunch of different definitions for different types of homicide. So first yeah. off, homicide is just killing another person. Homo <gasps> being Homo from the- side, man side. Yeah, man side, man, man side. Like from the Greek, you know, man or, yeah, Greek, right? Greek? Because Latin is homo. Mm. Yeah, which, no. Latin, oh God. So it's Latin. It's Latin. Yeah. Okay, so here's what's going on in my head right now. There's homo and homo. One of them means same and one of them means man. Yes. And I can't remember which language which is from. I'm going to say that homo meaning same is from the Greek and homo meaning man is Latin. I I'm feel pretty like sure that's Greeks right. are more gay than the Latin though. You ah, did no, not. You didn't study oh, Latin then. Gosh, buddy. Buddy. They, they were real Latin? gay. The Romans were they, super they were... gay. They uh, had a whole thing. We'll we'll talk about it at some point. I... Anyway, serial murder, also called serial killing, is the unlawful homicide of at least two people carried out by the same oh. person or persons in a separate event, in separate events occurring at different times. Although this definition is widely accepted, the crime is not formally recognized in any legal code, including that of the United States. States. Serial murder is distinguished from mass murder in which several victims are murdered at the same time and place. That is from Britannica. Oh, uh, okay. So what I really wanted to get at here is the sort of definition of serial killers as compared to mass murderers because these are kind of murky terms for, I guess, the general public. Like, people don't necessarily know what the exact difference is. So mass murder is essentially killing a lot of people at once. I think it's three or more people at once. Serial murder, you need to have sort of cool down time between it, right? You can't, um, you can't sort of go from an emotional high of killing someone and then hop right into killing someone else and then right into killing someone else. There needs to be that sort of cool down period. You need to wait a bit, collect yourself, and then go and kill <laughs> someone else after that. Right. But again, 
it's not something that is, you know, um, legally sort of yeah. recognized. It's something that I guess the media deals more with. Or, you know, if the police are looking for someone, they'll say we're looking for a serial murderer because it's someone who has, co- has committed a lot of murders. So serial meaning something that happens kind of regularly. I mean, we talk about the old Doctor Who serials, you know, ah. if something if a TV show is serialized, right? That sort of stuff. So you can see where the word serial comes in to mean serial killer, right? Yes. Okay. So serial killers are people that kill multiple people on different occasions right right they do it they, they make a habit of it gosh this is this is a very dark topic and yet somehow our sort of public view of it has made it so that it's not as dark as uh, it actually is yeah um and i just kind of want to talk about homicide in general so homicide is legally defined as the killing of another person um it's an all-inclusive term it, it, it encapsulates sort of all just all kinds of killing, right? Right. Homo, uh, homo, uh, home coming from the homo, meaning man, and side, meaning to kill. You yeah. know, if you add side to the end of it, it means you're killing something. So patricide, killing your dad. Um, you know, <gasps> regicide, king, killing a king. Leucocide. Oh, it sounds like I can't pronounce leucocide. <laughs> Lucaside. That would be a very, Luke- very, very unfortunate like misunderstanding there. <laughs> hey, man, can you get me some Lucaside from the shops, please? And oh, you come home with God. Luke's head on a bike. <laughs> <laughs> it worries me how readily your mind went to Lucaside. <laughs> Lucaside. <laughs> it does sound like Lucaside. Another main thing here as well is that serial homicide, so, you know, serial killings have to be intentional, right? Mm. You can't just accidentally do a bunch of manslaughters and call that <laughs> serial killing. There needs Can to be you an do a bunch there. of homicides and claim that you just did a bunch of manslaughters? What if it's just a coincidence? <laughs> it's just a coincidence times. that I slipped and my knife accidentally stabbed her 37 times and they were all blonde well, women I, yeah, under the a, age of 35. What a coincidence, had whoops! A, had a twitch or something. <laughs> No, was... no, no. I'm I don't really think... bad at driving. <laughs> and every week, I'm really bad at driving. <laughs> anyway, serial killers, that's what a serial killer is. Someone that kills multiple people on different occasions and they intend to do it. So do you know what sort of prevalence of serial killers maybe? Do you know how maybe that's changed over time? What do you know about serial killers? I mean, what do I know about serial killers? I want to say that there's like more serial killers now, but I feel like it will be a lot more difficult today to be a serial killer than it would have been like in the 1800s. They yeah. didn't have CCTV. <laughs> And like they just had moors that they dumped bodies in, like. <laughs> Look, yeah, being a murderer was a lot easier before we kind of brought in modern, I guess, what's the word? Um, forensic Forensics. techniques. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we did an episode on forensics. You can go ahead and watch that. But yeah, modern forensic, forensic techniques have made it a lot easier to catch serial killers. I mean, way back then, they were walking around crime scenes. They were touching stuff up. They didn't They didn't care about like whose blood it was. They. It didn't make a difference. That's just blood. Yeah. Whereas now, we take a sample of that blood and we can figure out, oh, whose blood is this? And I think you'd be surprised, well, I was certainly surprised at how modern some of the stuff that we take for granted is. So there's a great show called Life on Mars on BBC that was in the early 2000s about a detective who like gets transported back to 1970 and has to be a detective in 1970. Oh my God. And he says stuff like, take fingerprints from the body. And mm. they like laugh at him because they're like, you can't take fingerprints from skin. That's ridiculous. Like, that, And that's just the 70s and this was in the 2000s. That's the, at the time, 30 years ago, like it's such a basic thing, like finding out if someone has touched a person who's now dead was like not possible. That's mm. insane. And if you think about it now as well, DNA, we've had, you know, we've had sort of use it. We've been using DNA evidence for a bit, but also now that there's a rise of, um, let's say, those companies that take your DNA mm. and give you no. and give you your family history back. There is a much wider bank of DNA that we've got for people now yeah. than we used to. Is it accessible to law, law enforcement? I know that it was for one serial one serial killer wow. was caught because his family um, put in oh their put in their thing. and that's the thing that's what you need to pay attention to as well. The, the, the danger with all of these sort of um, things is that you don't need to give someone your DNA if someone has your mum's, your sisters, mm-hmm. your brothers, and your dad's DNA they can find you because there's not that much difference between you know what i mean like because your sister is a combination of your mom and your dad and you're a combination of your mom and your dad you can figure that out there's enough similarities there to be like it's probably this one right guys if you're planning on doing a serial killing just don't go on 23 and me it doesn't really matter how white you are (laughs) maybe don't do the serial killings in the first place is i think the main takeaway that you should probably oh yeah obviously yeah but yeah so prevalence so you're saying that you would have thought they would have decreased or increased what what you what you said well i I don't know because there's so many like factors that go into like why somebody would become a serial killer Mm -hmm. and i feel like nowadays there's more like external things that would be interfering in people's lives that could lead them around the door like down the wrong path like i feel like 
500 years ago, people lived quite simple lives and didn't have access to, like... Like, you can watch beheadings online, and people will be, like, extre- like extremist? Extremized? What's the word? Oh, radicalized. Radicalized. People will be radicalized from the internet, and I feel like... I don't know. I, I want to say there's more now. Really? Well, from what I've seen, they seem to have decreased quite a lot. There was maybe a surge in the sort of 70s and 80s. Yeah. But it's kind of really gone down. I mean, you've kind of hit the nail on the head as to one of the reasons why it seems that it's just a lot harder to get away with that yeah. kind of stuff now. I mean, don't get me wrong. The police are still pretty bloody terrible at doing their jobs. I mean, like, absolutely abysmal <laughs> at doing their jobs. They suck. But keep going. <laughs> but it is a lot easier to get caught now. He's got away with loads. Of loads of <laughs> I swear to God, if I was a serial killer, oh I would only get away for it. I would only get away with it as long as I kept my mouth shut. Which, man, I'd be dropping hints on this podcast all the time. I'd be like leaving cryptic clues in the in the descriptions and everything. Oh man, I don't know what I'd do because you you'd you'd be you'd be saying some stuff to me as well. And I just have to figure it out. Yeah. But I'd, I'd think I was going a little bit crazy. I was like, no, no way car is killing people. Like, that's insane. Oh, gosh, I'm really telling on myself here. Yeah. My flatmate in uni was a med student, right? And so she came home after doing anatomy for that day. And she was like, oh, so today it was mad. We had to rip eyes out of the cadaver's eye socket. And I was like, oh, man, I really wish I'd done medicine. Because I just want to, I just want to like rip eyes out of an eye socket of a cadaver and see what's going on. Do you guys not want to do like a no. dissection of a human and see what's going on inside? Um, I, I mean, it, w- it would be interesting. That doesn't mean I want to rip eyes out of a cadaver. It would be interesting to like. <laughs> yeah, it's it, interesting. No, it would be interesting to like look at like a body in the way that you see them in like anatomy books. But, yeah, but I don't get your think hands I'd enjoy all it that like much. get your hands all dirty. You know, like no, hands on experience. No, see, that's like the worst part for me. So like that's kind of worrying. You're wearing gloves. Wearing it. See, no, that's. I still think that's gross. I don't want to handle people's insides. Look, I wouldn't kill someone to do it, but let's say we're on. Let's say we're in a plane crash and someone just happens to die with a perfectly preserved body. No, you should stop talking. I'm rooting around in their organs. I'm having to see. Oh, as to how they do. And I would just like to say, if this clip is being used in a court proceeding, <laughs> I'd like to say hello to the jury um, and thank you for your public service. <laughs> No, like this is this is one of those things where I'm like, oh man, at some point maybe maybe I'll start being a med student just to get to that point, and then I'll and then I'll drop out. It's interesting. That's all I'm saying. It mm-hmm. just it just seems really really interesting. I just want to understand what's going on inside of us. It's 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 actually there. Are, there are ways to do that. Yeah. Not cutting open, that, a, you know, a, cutting open not a cada- cadaver. No. It's entirely consensual. Anyway, let's talk more about the prevalence of serial killers. Um, now, it says here that one in three people are serial killers. And there's three of... I'm joking. Excuse I'm me, joking. What? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> one in three murderers are serial killers? No, no, no. I, there's three of us, Luke. Okay. That was the joke. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, it's not me. It's not me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> no, so um, the thing is that I think we think there are more serial killers than there are. It says here that, you know, pop popular media, academic researchers, they they said that um, there were on average 5,000 victims each year in the US. Uh, but actually, the number seems to be maybe quite a bit lower than that. I mean, in the, in the 1980s, the real number was probably fewer than 200. How do they figure out that they're victims of serial killings and not just like victims of like a one-off murder? Well, that's the thing. That's why there was such a high number oh, before. Okay. That's, that's where you get the difference yeah. in some of these data points in that with the higher numbers, they're, they're kind of just taking unexplained murders and linking them all together where they probably shouldn't. It's very silly. So that kind of exaggeration of the number of serial killers, I feel has kind of led to this Mm. idea that there are are a lot of them. Like, there aren't that many serial killers in the world, and yet they're such a, I guess, cultural icon. Does that make sense? It's weird to say a cultural icon, but they are worshipped in a sense, even if it's in infamy, right? You know, you've got true crime podcasts, you've got multiple films about your famous serial killers, Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, all of that sort of stuff. There's TV shows about serial killers, like Dexter, for example, right? We talk about serial killers killers quite often, and for quite a, for such like a sort of uncommon crime, it's weird that literally every single person who speaks English probably knows what a serial killer is, Mm. right? Yeah, it's interesting that people will be like, oh, I'm scared I'm going to be killed by a serial killer. It's like, it's very unlikely. <laughs> That's so incredibly <laughs> unlikely. I'm scared they're going to die on planes, too. 
That's also very unlikely. That's, that is also unlikely. Yeah. So serial killers do exist, even though they're not as common as you might think. But, you know, we want to kind of get into the head of the serial killer now, don't we? I'm, I assume that's what people wanted us to talk about when they requested we do an episode on serial killers. And that makes sense, because when you look at all of the studies on serial killers, they're really just, I guess, psychological profiles. A lot of them are case studies. I mean, that is generally what people try to look at. And we'll kind of talk about maybe some of the problems with that in a little bit. Just before before we jump into that, though, very quickly, I'll give you some numbers to, to stick with you. Uh, serial murders are about 1% of mm -hmm. all murders. It's not very common. If we look at the sort of gender ratio of this, um, yeah, no, I mean, seriously. So by 2010, most serial killers in the US were men. That's 2,910 compared to 294 women serial killers. Also, oh. slightly more than half of all serial killers in the studied range were white. 51.7%. Um, and, you know, we're talking about the kind of that decrease of serial killers um, over time. And we've also noticed, I guess, an increase in mass murders, or at least at the very least, it seems that there's been an increase in yeah. mass murders, right? I mean, especially in the US yeah, the <laughs> yeah. with guns and, and schools and nightclubs and cinemas and churches and synagogues and, and anywhere where there's a gathering of people yeah especially minorities yeah. that you don't like um anyway so the point here is that i'm going to make very briefly is that some people have suggested oh hey maybe serial killers have just become mass murderers now but the the thing with that is that what's been said by i guess experts is that they don't really have the same sort of psychological profile. Ah. Yeah, so they're not really the same kind of person. I mean, it kind of makes sense a little bit when you think about it as well, if you look at the sort of, I guess, stereotypes that are associated with these two different mm. kinds of people. I'm yep. not saying that the stereotypes are absolutely <laughs> yeah. scientific fact, but you you can you can see that there are very different kinds of crimes. There's there's a very big difference between taking a gun and shooting a lot of people at once in what could be a sort of fit of rage, mm. one emotional state, and this sort of premeditated let's mm. let's kill someone, see how it feels, do it again, see how it feels, and have to continually evade people. Because if you think about it, like a lot of mass murderers either kill themselves or turn themselves in. Yeah. 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 Right? Or they want to be killed by law, law enforcement a lot of the time Exactly. As well. Like yeah. death by cop. Like, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Well, it's also like the, the motivation is obviously very different. Like mm. if you're a mass killer, you're a serial killer, <clears throat> and you're like, you're really good at covering up, surely. Yes. And like that, that's like a routine kind of thing. Like that's like, it's almost like a, not, I'm not going to say it's a job, but it's like a lot of work goes into that. It does whereas, take dedication, yeah. Yeah, but whereas like if you're a mass killer and like, say like, like, like you're a school shooter, the motivation is that people haven't treated you well at school. And then that happens. It's not the same as like going out, finding someone, killing them, and then, you know, doing the same next month. And it's also a lot more personal as well, if you think about it. You know, like a mass murder is oftentimes attacking a group or it, yeah. it's for some kind of ideology and serial killers seem to not do that. They seem to be more sort of, okay, this is a very personal thing. And, you know, that's why if with, with certain serial killers, you'll see them going after the same kind of person. Yeah. And what's interesting as well is I, I was reading this sort of article that was looking at doctors who were serial killers sort of in the past. So there was, a, I guess, a, it seemed to be, and I, I don't know how sort of, I guess, reputable this is, but from what I read there, it seems that there were more doctors who were serial killers in the past, you know, like quite a, like mm. quite a long time ago. And that's kind of decreased now. But if you think about it, if you're a serial killer, or if you've got that kind of urge to like cut people up and look inside them and you don't really have the empathy to care, <laughs> to care about, you don't have the empathy to care about the harm that you cause to people, <laughs> right? it would make sense to become a doctor, yeah. you know, a century or two ago, because that's a job where you get to cut into people and you know, like you do what you want. And if you start cutting into people as a doctor, you're like, oh man, this is cool and I don't have any empathy. You might go ahead and start killing people. Like there's the, there's the sort of um, idea, I don't know if it's a myth or not, but there was the idea that Jack the Ripper was a doctor, right? Did they ever find out who that was? Jack the Ripper? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's, <laughs> there's no chance of finding out who Jack the Ripper is at this point. No, yeah, he's long gone. So Corey, if you were wanting to be a murderer then, mm -hmm. which job would you take up if doctoring is not the one now? Oh, Gosh, I mean, you'd have to have a job wherein you're able to interact with people that won't be missed, but also in such a way that, look, no, 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 what? no, what? don't get me to confess to this now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an undercover cop. <laughs> You're under arrest. So I just want to quickly touch on one more time for the last time, the sort of prevalence of serial killers in the US. So there's a bunch of different numbers. I've had 2,000 active serial killers. Um, apparently, uh, there's been over uh, 
751,785 murders carried out in the US since 1976. And um, someone looked at all of those. Those aren't necessarily all ser- serial yeah. murders. Uh, but, um, you know, someone uh, looked at all of those, developed an algorithm to look through them and try to track unsolved murders. Um, and from that, that's where they got the sort of 2,000 number. There's someone else named Michael Artfield who thinks that that number is a lot higher, 3,000 or 4,000. He says that the FBI estimates aren't very reliable. And I'm going to read this verbatim from where I found it. It says, he is also the author of 12 books if you're interested in the mind of a serial killer. So uh, maybe this man has a vested interest in making people think there are more <laughs> serial killers than there are. That's all I'm going to say. I was going to say, why, why, why does he know that there's more? Because he used to work as a police detective. That's not reassuring. I honestly do not trust this man. He could be right, but I don't trust this man at all on the basis of him being a former police detective and also someone who is selling books on serial killers, oh. right? Like, if you if you are both of those things and you're saying, actually, there are way more serial killers than you <laughs> think. You guys don't even know. You guys, you don't, guys even... don't even know. There's, there's way more serial killers out there. Read my book to find <laughs> out, though. Like, just read my book to find out. Yeah, no, so, I mean, the number of serial killers, it's hard to pinpoint because, I mean, by their very nature yeah if we knew like, if we knew how many serial killers there were people wouldn't be out there serial killing because we'd chuck them all in jail or yeah. i don't know make them vets or put them on the police force whatever it is we do with vets i don't know like, <laughs> kill animals you know a healthy outlet i feel like i feel like euthanizing an animal for like old age is not quite coming from the same motivation as like murdering a person yeah you don't get quite get the same rush anyway no. um t- <laughs> Are you trying to come across as a bit of a serial killer? I'm not trying, it's just happening. (laughs) Well, just to be naturally good at something. So let's get into the mind of a serial killer then. So what would you say... Yeah, what is it like being you, Gary? Gosh, guys, come on. (laughs) What would you say the sort of... um, If you were to use one word to describe the sort of um, psychology of a serial killer, what might it be? Psychopath. Psychopath. Okay, good. That's dead wrong. No, do you know why psychopath might be a poor term to use to describe anyone? I feel like I should know Do they not exist? Are they not real? Yeah, that's right. I thought you would know this. You studied psychology, you know what, a little bit. We, 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 We did psychopath so I mean, if you I don't remember that. if you kind of look, no, it's, it's okay if you kind of look into this, and this is a very very common thing. People think that psychopathy is an actual disorder, it's an actual thing. Psychopathy is more of a colloquial name to, to, to sort of refer to people who have antisocial personality disorder, mm. ASPD, right? And it's not a great term. It's pretty. It's a yeah. pretty rubbish way of describing that group of people. My apologies. Well, no, it, it, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? And it's more of a legal term than it is even remotely, I guess, a medical or scientific term, right? Mm, yeah. It's, it'd be used more there than, any, than anywhere else. And I'm not even saying that it is an official legal term. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it, it doesn't actually specifically refer to any sort of psychological uh, profile or type. It's just it's just a word we use to describe people that have antisocial personality disorder um, and not a great word that we use to describe it. I, I've got a little quote here. It says, well, antisocial personality disorder is a medical diagnosis. The term psychopathy, which belongs to the sphere of f- forensic psychiatry, may be understood as a legal diagnosis. It's still not possible to identify an effective treatment for serial killers, right? And it makes sense because serial killers aren't necessarily all going to have the same underlying psychology. I mean, yeah. obviously, you'd probably have to have a lower level of empathy you know and a desire to like you know hurt people or kill people or anything like that but other than that like other than those two things you don't there's like you could have kind of any other underlying psychology right there's a lot of different ways that you could you could end up having low empathy and a, a desire to you know harm others or a desire to you know like you know, to fall through and end up killing people. Yeah, it's really interesting as well, because as far as I've seen, so there's two things, again, number two thing that you'll have to fact check for me, Corey, but I find it so interesting that it's worth mentioning, is that there's something along the lines of, um, it's from old literature, so it used the word psychopath, but it talked about the level of psychopath or the level of people with low empathy um, is kind of stable within the population. Mm. Because if there's a low level of people with low empathy, then the conditions, the people, the, everybody else who has the empathy gets complacent. Mm. Um, and it's now easier to be somebody to get away with being a low empathy person. Mm-hmm. And if there's too many people with low empathy, then the rest of the population are really like attuned and pay close attention to. And those people are more easily detected and pushed out of the society. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the there's like a sweet spot of population level 
level for low empathy, right? Um, and the second thing is, is I find it very interesting that you that it's like described as like a disorder because obviously in a social setting, it's not necessarily a, 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 a good thing for everybody else. But there's a very clear evolutionary it's a, it's an evolutionary sort of lane that 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 somebody could take that, mm. that a genome could take is to go oh actually there are certain things there are certain like um societally expected things in this society and because they because they're expected everybody thinks that you're doing them automatically mm-hmm. i as a genome could randomly evolve and then be more successful if i take advantage of other people's um, sort of uh, trust, trust. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Uh, and I could get like a slightly freer ride, and my genes are then going to be more successful in the gene pool. Um, that's that, that's to call that a disorder is sort of a. It's an interest. I understand that there are also probably other ways. Like I won't ruin where we're going. Oh no, absolutely. There are other ways that somebody could have low empathy. I've, I've read a couple of books about um, psychopathy in quotes. Um, which could be like structural changes in the brain, for example. Mm-hmm. But it's also there is also a clear way how a, of how a genome could end up being that way. Well, yeah, and I think you've kind of touched on something that I find really interesting. I think our individualism, that sort of underlying individualism that's very present in, let's say, sort of Western mm. culture. And when I say Western culture, I'm really mainly talking about the UK and the US to yeah. an extreme degree. Oh my God, the US, absolutely. Mm. Canada... Those sorts of places, right? I think that level of individualism has absolutely ruined our understanding of evolution, genetics, because we look at it as an individual's sort of um, ability to survive and pass on their genes, as Mm. opposed to thinking about the entire population, right? If you look at the sort of the gay uncle theory, where, you know, if um, there's there's sort of idea that if you've got sort of multiple children or multiple boys, you're more likely to have the younger ones being gay. um, And that could be that could be sort of due to the more sort of um, harm that sort of hormone washes in the womb or whatever. But the evolution evolutionary benefit to that is that you then have someone with your genetics who is there to to care for Mm. your children, Mm. right? You've already made enough males who are going to go off and sire other children elsewhere. And now you've got a, yeah, (laughs) you know, you've got, now you've got a male who is not going to go off and uh, create their own offspring, but is going to be there and present to help care for the offspring Mm. of similar genetics, right? Mm. And, you know, if you, if you, if you look at other species and, you know, population, like population wide, like think about you social insects right it does not it's not a great it's not a great evolutionary uh, thing for the individual insect who gets its head ripped off right or you know who is one of the workers right who sacrifices themselves to save the queen or to save the rest of the colony Oh, but yeah, that benefits evol- them. <laughs> that benefits the community. But it benefits yeah. the community. And we should probably think about evolution the less in terms mm. of individual benefit. I mean, there are, there are obviously upsides to that, and that does work in some cases. But evolutionarily speaking, it's not always going to be about individual benefit. It's going to, it's sometimes going to be about the species as a whole or, you know, the sort of Gene, the, the sort of genes coming from you know one set of one set of parents, right? Like there's there's more to it than survival of the fittest on an absolute individual level, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. And that level of individualism just completely messes with our understanding of that. It also that level of individualism also, however, creates um, the perfect opportunity for people with lower empathy to sort of succeed. Mm. If you're in a society where um, sort of you know i i studied economics and economics is of is it oh, tries God. to create basically a, a, a at least foundational economics tries to create like a, a sort of model of how people are inherently selfish but then they do selfless things from a selfish for a selfish reason it's all very interesting there's a there's a kind of adlerian psychology stuff covers that as well to a certain extent um uh, but yeah, like the, the, I mean, there's the kind of joke. I mean, there's there, there is the statement which is, I think, probably actually potentially not true about like most CEOs are sociopaths or something. And it turns out that's I think actually it's that there was just that there was like a higher rate of sociopaths within that role, like higher ups. Yeah, which makes which makes sense. But then also, yeah. you don't need to you don't need to um, be a sociopath to succeed there, right? <laughs> you are, people are it able helps. to. Well, no, what I'm saying is people are very much able to explain away anything to themselves. People can justify what they want to do pretty bloody well, right? I mean, if you if you look at the logic that some CEOs use, some people those higher ups use, it doesn't make any sense. 
Mm. But you can see how they can use it to convince themselves that what they're doing is fine. Like, that's why I love sometimes having conversations with capitalists who are, like, you know, absolutely, almost absolutely blind to all of the, the problems with capitalism because they're like, oh, but actually it's good in in this way that I've made up in my head that makes me able yeah. to sleep at night, right? I, I think it's interesting because... You know, I, I don't think people are necessarily inherently selfish. Really, I think we're almost taught to be more selfish than we naturally would be, right? Because kids can be so kind and sharing and whatnot, right? Mm, like, but they can also be very selfish. Oh, kids can, absolutely, <laughs> they absolutely can be, but they also can be not that, and they're learning to kind of be people. And what I'm saying is that you can kind of, you can kind of guide kids into sort of um you can guide kids into being sort of one way or the other and not just through telling them you know what they should do but also from the lessons that they sort of subconsciously learn through living in this society and the society that we live in right now is one that kind of teaches you a little bit in a lot of cases to kind of just look out for yourself right mm. like when you get a job if you get your first job you're on minimum wage I was I was working and I thought I'll work hard because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to work hard and and that's a good thing. You'll be rewarded. It's good for everyone. That is not what happens. If you have a job and you're on if you're on like sort of hourly wage or you're on minimum wage, especially if you're on a minimum wage, do as little as you possibly can because no one else is going to reward you for it, right? Like that is that is the society that we live in right now, but we absolutely could have one where you're you're rewarded like for helping others because helping others in itself is rewarding right like if you if you help support other people they help support you it is good for everyone mm. oh my god altruism it works crazy <laughs> let's get back to serial killers yeah let's so ASPD, antisocial personality disorder. We could do a whole episode on it, but let's just quickly run through it now. Um, the NHS says that it's a particularly challenging type of personality disorder characterized by impulsive, irresponsible, and often criminal behavior. Now, I find that interesting, right? Mm. That this disorder, it, it's it's kind of, on the NHS, is tied to criminal behavior there, which yeah. makes sense. I understand how that works, but... Criminal behavior is something that is pretty much entirely subjective, yeah. right? You know, there because laws can change, all of that sort of stuff. I don't think that's the best way to describe it. I mean, yes, societally it does make sense and it is an easy way for people to understand what is going, I guess, sort of the outcomes, but it doesn't necessarily help you understand the underlying psychology yeah, there. Yeah, and also if you're like looking up symptoms of like whatever the how you think you have and you come upon like the NHS website and mm. it's like, "Oh, you you've just been diagnosed with this thing?" Yes. Criminal behavior. It's, yeah. it's kind of already assigning like a negative, which I'm sure the, exp yeah. the experience like living in the society that we live in, having a disorder like that, like mm. must be difficult. But oh, yeah. uh, but <laughs> immediately like on the first page when you go on the website for it to be like criminal behavior, bit much. But equally, I also wonder if like if somebody's trying to. So for example, I know that one of the expressions of um, AS ASP. ASPD. SPD in like childhood is often like um like killing cats I think there's a, I've, I've read a lot about that before. Really? Um like just like ha getting enjoyment from like killing cats or killing like rabbits or stuff like that. Like, what's interesting but then what's interesting to me is that you know people will kill bugs for like and, and get enjoyment out of that, right? Yeah, but the cat kind of gives you feedback that it's not having a good time. No, no, I know. I'm not <laughs> I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that they're the same thing, but what I'm saying is that people will get enjoyment out of killing bugs, people can get enjoyment out of killing, you know, like even things a little bit bigger. Mm. You could get up to maybe like mice. Someone could en someone could enjoy having a mouse trap and be like, "I got you, mouse." Yeah, yeah sure. Absolutely. And it's so weird to me how our empathy sort of our level of empathy changes based on what we like what we kind of find cuter right I mean I look I understand I understand yeah. the difference that they're giving you they're, they're giving you different feedback yeah generally for most people you're gonna be you're gonna be getting a certain emotional response from a rabbit that you wouldn't be getting from say like a little a little salamander oh my god salamanders are cute though or like a little a little bug or something yeah. right and ants can't scream ants can't scream in a way that you can hear but oh boy do those pheromones <laughs> <laughs> but what I wonder about there is like if, if you're somebody who who's grown up with ASPD and you kind of like, you know, you're actually just Googling your own thing. Yeah. And you see on there potentially criminal behavior that might if you've like had a past of like killing cats and rabbits. Yeah, and stuff, that could be it might make me like, helpful, oh, yeah. oh, I, I'll go and seek help because I don't I don't necessarily want to be yeah. on this and I'll go and seek help. And I at least have an explanation as to why I did that. Yeah. Um, it wasn't just I'm 
I'm the worst, I'm the <laughs> yeah. Satan spawn or whatever. Yeah. yeah, but unfortunately, our justice system just isn't really set up for anything like that, right? Yeah. I mean, the fact that the NHS is saying, hey, this disorder can often lead to criminal behavior. Oh, do we not have any accommodations for, for that? Do we, do we send those people to jail still? Maybe, maybe, maybe if there's an increased chance of um, committing a crime, mm. we should then restructure our prison system such that it's entirely rehabilitative <laughs> rather than punitive and all of that nonsense, right? Because punishing people for things like this, it's not necessarily going to help. We're not talking about serial killers right now, by the way. Punishing yeah. serial killers <laughs> is, I would say, largely kind of fine, right? I mean, you're not gonna. I mean, it's, it's. I feel like. This is a difficult one, right? Rehabilitation with serial killers, is it possible? I don't know, because how often do we actually catch serial killers mm. and get them behind mm. bars? But let's get back to the ASPD, right? So just very, very briefly, the sort of sign symptoms of this. Um, it says a person with antisocial personality disorder might exploit, manipulate, or violate the rights of others, lack concern, regret, or emotions about other people's distress, behave irresponsibly, or show disregard for normal social behavior, have difficulty sustaining long-term relationships, be unable to control their anger, lack guilt or not learn from their mistakes, blame others for problems in their lives, and repeatedly break the law law. Um, you know, I mean, and it says here that they could have a history of um, conduct disorder during childhood, um, such as truancy, delinquency, um, other disruptive or aggressive behaviors. So, mm. I mean, to understand it in the simplest possible way, antisocial personality disorder is kind of the label that we give to people who are very disruptive and kind of break a lot of social norms in a way that is generally kind of harmful or disrespectful or not necessarily empathetic to the rights and you know feelings of others. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's a, <laughs> I, there's, I follow a few people on TikTok with ASPD. Mm. It's very interesting to hear them talk about stuff because they're like fully aware of like their diagnosis and their motivations behind it. But it's very interesting to, like some of them will be asked questions like, so like your boyfriend cheats on you, what do you do? And they just go through this most, most like ruthless like punishment for him. And they just, they're smiling through the whole thing. It's very interesting. But what's interesting to me about that is, that, and I don't want to, I, I want to be very clear. I don't think that, you know, everyone who has ASPD is, oh, a, is yeah. a horrible person who's a criminal. Obviously not. We shouldn't be tying them so so tightly to serial killers, right? There are so, so few serial killers yeah. and so many people with ASPD. Like these two things are not as mm. neatly linked as people might mm. want to think, right? Yeah. But what I find interesting is that I, I look, I get stuck on TikTok looking at all of these am I the asshole things on Reddit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> rather than going to Reddit, Reddit itself yeah, for it, yeah. I get stuck on TikTok having a, an, an automated voice read it out to me. And I like to look through the comments every now and then and dear God, are those people vindictive? Like they will do and they, they will say, oh, you should do this horrible thing to your boyfriend for what could be a misunderstanding. Yeah. Like seriously, mm. some people are way more vindictive than than I would like to think they are. It, that was that was one of the things um, about the internet as well, about trolling and things like that, mm. is that you, it doesn't, because of the way that you're bringing in the, in the information, it doesn't always trigger the empathy response that you'd get yeah. in what like looking at the person. Um, and so it sort of makes us all a little bit less empathetic um, because ultimately our, I, 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 my sort of layman's understanding, it would be like you have a stimulus, like for example, you're, cutting open a rabbit and it's screaming mm -hmm. and the stimulus of like the screaming d sort of does something it stimulates something that changes the behavior in the brain and then and then in most people they then change course yeah if they're like halfway through killing a rabbit you probably haven't got that far uh <laughs> if you have your empathy center and it's and it's doing its job you probably haven't got that far mm -hmm. uh to the fact the rabbit screaming but yeah you're sort of yeah, there's a behavior some part of your brain is doing a behavior and then another some stimulus goes no let's not do that behavior mm -hmm. But we are not set up for that via the internet. We don't, there isn't a way of like conveying a piece of information necessarily that will then trigger the correct part of the brain, the empathic response that changes the behavior. Well, yeah, I think what's, I think what people don't seem to consider a lot is that you consciously thinking something doesn't mean all that much necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's not that's not how your brain always works. There's a lot of brain going on underneath that consciousness <laughs> that, that your consciousness isn't super aware of. And just because you're consciously aware that you're speaking to another human person on the internet, that doesn't mean that all of those bits underneath that usually mm. do the work to make you, you know, I guess, be a generally all right person to other people, doesn't mean that those bits underneath 
are going to understand that yeah. they're talking to another actual person. There's a really interesting thing on this. So earlier on, Corey, you were talking about how the individualistic society sort of has given us a false understanding of, of genes and about mm -hmm. evolution. So the popularization of Roughly what you're talking about there was by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene, mm. which like popularized this new understanding of of um, genetics, uh, invented the word meme, um, <laughs> oh, yes. and also sort of yeah, led us to understand genetics in terms of like, why does the runt of the litter voluntarily kill itself? It's not because it wants to die. It's because the copies of its genes are in its brothers and sisters. And so it, it, it's better for, it's not better for the species, it's better for the genes that are mm -hmm. present in both that dog and also its brothers and sisters. Mm. Um, and before that, the, pre the precursor to that, to uh, uh, Dawkins' selfish gene, was these two scientists who basically had, they did some calculation, they had some formula that basically came, helped them come to the conclusion that the best thing that a human being can do for itself and for its genes is to be empathetic and, and help other people. Yeah. But the same formula also came to the conclusion that the other best thing that somebody can do <sighs> is kill distant relatives of themselves. So identify who is the furthest away from me, relatively, relatively speaking. So who is like the most not my brother, mm -hmm. most not my family, and kill them. How does mm. that benefit? Because... You, when you're being altruistic, you are helping copies of your own genome, right? Yeah. So, like, there's a certain amount of my genome that's also in you. There's a certain amount of my genome hey. that's also in Corey, hey. right? Hey, Get out buddy. of here. Whoa. Whoa. Get what out of here. Doing, <laughs> oh, God, sorry, that took me way longer than I, <laughs> than I should have done. Sorry. Okay. Uh, so, there's a certain amount of my genes that are also in most of the people I know, right? Yeah. And so... <laughs> stop. Really? I don't know about that. I've not heard this. I've got some explaining to do to my wife. Uh, no, you know, God, stop it. Okay, we share, let me just phrase this, we share some of the same genes. From cum. No! <laughs> <laughs> You've not even thrown subtlety out the window there. No, no, thank you very much. So, we share in our cells some of the same genes. Okay. Right? And in and from the perspective of those genes that we share, it is in our, it is in their interest for us to help each other, right? Yeah. But then, whoever is um, least related to you... Oh, so not distant relatives. The most distant Everyone's, relative. Everyone Everyone's is related. I see what you mean. Okay, so okay. The yeah, most so distant, I, th I thought yeah. you meant like, oh, your third cousin. <laughs> Murder them. Right. No, no, no. Like, no. as distant as... But, uh, yeah. as dis the person on the planet who is at least, least genetically related to you. Yeah, no, that, that makes way more sense. That, so, yeah. basically, what I was getting at was that this precursor to the selfish gene theory was these two scientists, and mm -hmm. they came up with this formula that was like, oh, you should be good to everyone, but then the same outcome outcome was also you should be bad to the people furthest away from you. Be good to people, nice to you, be bad to people. Oh, they just invented racism again. Gosh, they just, darn it. Yeah, so, it was kind yeah, of... Well, it's yeah. so easy to do a racism, right? Like, <laughs> racism, it's so... You always come back to it. It's racism, eugenics, we're always falling into it. Anyway, <laughs> I'm cutting that. <laughs> <laughs> ding -ling, ling is that the ad bell? He's ringing again. Why is he ringing this time, Cory? He's ringing for After Dark Luke. Why have we gendered our ad bell, Cory? Because he's a boy and I want to <laughs> respect him just like I respect After Dark, our sister show to this podcast, Psy Guys. After Dark is what happens after Psy Guys ends. We just chat about whatever we want to chat about. If you've ever been listening to Psy Guys and gone, God, I wish there were less facts, uh, then you can listen to After Dark. I wish there were more opinions in this show. More philosophy uh, and more... politics. Uh, yes, After Dark is the show where Corey and I sit down, and maybe with a guest sometimes, sit down and discuss just more sort of floaty, woo-woo-y ideas about things we think with our brains. And where can they watch this wonderful, wonderful show, Luke? Well, they can listen to it and watch it at patreon.com forward slash Psy Hi guys, our Patreon, where you can also support us and help us keep doing this thing that you apparently like us doing. Did you say patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys? Yes, I think I did. I think I did say patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys. Well, if you want to listen to After Dark, it seems like you should get to patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys. That's patreon.com forward slash Psy Guys in case you weren't paying attention. Now pay attention because we're about to start the show. Oh, my attention has been paid and will continue to be paid until the end when I go home. <laughs> So I guess the question that comes next is why do people become serial killers? We already know what serial killers are. We understand some of the psychology that um, some serial killers may have, you know, that sort of lower empathy and whatnot. But why do people become serial killers? One of the main things 
is child abuse, apparently. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Yeah, treating kids not nice makes them n- n- less nice as adults sometimes. That's something that seems it's to happen. It's crazy that the way you treat your children uh, affects the rest of their life. Yeah, and how they treat other people. Yeah. It's almost as though raising a child is a really important thing that yeah. we should all actually consider how we're going to go about doing it yeah. before we decide to pop a couple out. Yeah, maybe. And maybe people should have more support in raising children. Maybe we should help people understand the best practices for raising children. And we should make it so that raising children isn't something that's harder if you have less wealth. You bloody commie. <laughs> commie? Yeah, probably. Yeah, well, yeah. That was an insult. It's, just, it's a statement. <laughs> so the World Health Organization, uh, that defi- they define child abuse as all forms of physical and or emotional ill treatment. Um, oh, gosh, I don't want to talk about all of this. Look, you know what child abuse is, right? Yeah. Negligence, abuse, all kinds of abuse, all of that, all of that sort of stuff. Um, exploitation um, that results in actual or potential harm to the child. I mean, that covers basically all yeah. child abuse. Um, but, you know, when when re- people are researching um, sort of serial killers, I'll, I think that comes up a lot is abuse during childhood. And I want to I want to briefly talk here about the studies that people do on serial killers. As I said, a lot of them are case studies. A lot of them are things that look at a few different serial killers that have been caught and they try to say, okay, what are the things that tie them together? Yeah. I already take issue with, with the <laughs> yeah. way that this is done because this is such a such an uncommon kind of crime. And I think dry, trying to uh, trying to sort of tie such a, 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 a sort of strict thread on this is maybe not the best way to go about it. Mm. It's almost, I, I feel like you might almost be kind of um, is it begging the question? I feel like you might almost be sort of looking for the answer that you think you're going to find, right? Yeah. You're, you're going to find the answer that you think you're probably going to find because you're kind of setting yourself up for it. Um, I'm not saying that all of those studies are doing that, but just from what I've just from what I've seen, looking at sort of the overall kind of studies on serial killers, it's it 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 seems like a bit of an odd area of study to me because there's not a lot on there's not a lot on the overall psychology of serial killers there's not a lot on you know sort of um that more sort of in-depth stuff that i would have wanted to look at it's mostly looking at either individual case studies or trying to look um trying to look overall and say oh what are these general things that that maybe tie these groups together Mm. um but yeah so um there is a strong link between early childhood abuse and uh, people who uh, kill for sexual gratification, apparently. Um, but, you know, I mean, essentially, childhood abuse um, is linked to serial killers' later behaviours, but we don't understand sort of how child abuse then leads mm. to different <clears throat> types of serial killer. Because, you know, obviously there are different there are people there are different kinds of serial killers. There's people who are serial killers who sort of commit sexual violence. There's people mm. who are serial killers who sort of taunt the police and leave riddles and yeah. act kind of like a Batman villain. There's people <laughs> yeah. who do it, you know, uh, as a power thing. And that's actually probably one of the, that's probably the main mm. reason mm. for serial killing. Yeah. No matter how, sort of whether it's, you know, through sexual abuse or sexual, for sexual gratification or whatever, um, the, the power imbalance there, the sort of power, um, holding power over someone is what seems to come up an awful mm. lot when you look at studies on serial killers. Because obviously a lot of the causes of being a serial killer are dependent on, like, not how they're socialised, but their life experiences. Mm -hmm. Is there anything on people who are just, like, have a completely normal life, an absence of any, like, those kind of negative experiences, and they still end up being a serial killer? I I guess, is ASPD ASPD something that you're born with? I'm not so sure. So ASPD is something that I think can only be diagnosed in adulthood. So we did uh, we did an episode on oppositional defiant disorder yeah. uh, recently. I mean, I say recently, it was last year. Yeah. So we, oh, it was this year, actually. We did one quite recently. But um, I think I think the, the, the issue is that ASPD is kind of um, a diagnosis that leads on from a previous diagnosis in childhood often. And so... It's kind of difficult to say, is that something that's inbuilt? Is that something that comes from environment? In all likelihood, it's probably a, mm, probably probably a, a bit of both, both yeah. right? Um, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of, um, I guess, sort of serial killers that led otherwise normal lives, yeah. it's a tough thing to look into because there's such a sensationalized view of serial killers. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, the, the fact that there's so many TV shows about all these different serial killers and, oh, how interesting are they? This person that seemed totally normal, this charming, this charismatic person. Ugh. Like, it's... 
you got there's a lot to wade through, right? Yeah. You know, I was I mean, I I made the choice before I started this episode. I did not want to turn this into a true crime podcast. I'm not going to sit and talk about John Wayne Gacy or um, you know, uh Jeffrey Dahmer for the entire time because I just don't I don't find that remotely interesting. Let's go into grisly details of somebody's murder. It's a couple it's a couple guys, it's a few blokes that murdered horribly a lot of people. Yeah. And I I don't think that we I don't think that it's terribly worthwhile to spend a lot of time getting into the heads of such a small, small group of criminals. You know what I mean? Like yeah. there there are better ways to spend our time and also dragging, you know, family's trauma out yeah. into the open is just just a horrible well, thing to do. Well, that literally exact thing happened to me. Like, my cousin was very brutally murdered, like, ten years ago. Mm. And, like, Sky News were trying to make... Well, like, Sky were trying to make a documentary about it, all that, blah, blah, blah. I was on the news, I was on TV, like, everywhere. Mm. Like, you can Google it, and it's pages and pages and pages. But I found a few podcast episodes about it, and I was like, whoa, these people don't really think about how they're impacting people's lives because it's, it's one thing doing like a true crime episode about like somebody whose family member like died like 200 years ago and there's yeah. and there's like and like there's a difference between that and like people doing it for stuff that happened recently where their families are still like dealing with the aftermath of it well yeah exactly i mean it's it, that's the thing it's it, it's really especially with a serial killer right mm. because with a serial with serial killings it's 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 kind of it separates itself from other murders where a lot of yeah. murders are from people that you know right yeah. like that's that's one of the most common things you're murdered by someone that you know you're not it's not a common thing to be murdered by someone that you know it's common yeah. in murders for the <laughs> <Yeah>. that's <laughs> one of the most common things <laughs> it happens to us all you know cars, feel when dogs, you're murdered by cats someone and then <laughs> being murdered by somebody you know <laughs> a lot of murders are committed by you know uh, someone that knows the victim mm. whereas serial killings yeah. kind of diverge from that a little bit right yeah. because of the nature of that kind of crime and what's really mad to me is that we we sort of we we not exactly venerate these serial killers but just like a little bit we kind of do right and way more than any other crime no exactly yeah. right yeah. it's not like oh, wow what's the psychology of bank robbers but that's, that's <laughs> more interesting the psychology to me psychology of bank robbers I mean the psychology of bank robbers that's that's just how we get um uh, what is it called Stockholm syndrome which doesn't even exist right yeah. it's like oh well how, how could you like a criminal that's kidnapped you whilst they're robbing a bank Maybe because they're actually not as bad as the, Sometimes as the, they're as the police, you know. Yeah. yeah. But but the point here is that with serial killers, you know, like it's it's one of those things where it's a lot. If you start if you start bringing up the crimes of a serial killer, it's a lot of people who are kind of unrelated to the killer, yeah. but but who have been victims of them, and it's a lot of families that are being reminded of probably the worst day in their life, and they don't. They, there's there's no closure because it's just I guess a senseless killing. They they matched probably maybe a profile. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah. And they ended up getting murdered by someone who murders a lot of people. And it's also interesting because, like, in terms of, like, true crime and that kind of stuff, when they're reporting on, like, serial killers, it's not like they're... If it was, like, a, a single murder, they'd, like, they'd go into the family and, like, what the person was like. But when it comes to serial killers, you're just, like, a data point. Like, oh, yeah. if somebody has killed, like, 20 people, mm. they're not going to give each mm. victim the amount of respect that, like, they all deserve. It's just like, oh, so he killed this guy and then this guy and then this guy and then this guy. I guess it's kind of... it's it, What you've just said there, um, Corey, is that, like, like, it's just random, wrong place, wrong time. Is It's kind of like... Maybe that's... It's kind of like how reporting on terrorism is so captivating mm. when it happens because ex ex exactly why what you've just said because it's like you can't spot it yeah like you could be like just going about your day i sometimes get this moment where i'm like on a tube platform or i'm like sitting outside at a restaurant um on like a normal evening and i'm like oh my god this is what it was like for like the pet people in the paris attacks yeah they were just sitting like this and then suddenly they were dead yeah like that's so boggling to your mind mm. because you can't possibly compute it and you can't possibly try to foresee it in the way that you could try to spot if somebody in your friendship group is really aggressive yeah. or like yeah. try to spot if someone you're friends with has this condition where they don't have empathy or like trying to spot things like that which are actually mm -hmm. like you know oh i can do that i can do some thinking about it but if it's like oh you could be on a train yeah and that's talk, it i mean we yeah. talk about the zodiac killer it's oh you I'm I'm going out for lunch with my boyfriend. Oh, I'm sitting in the car. Oh, I'm doing this. Oh, I'm doing that. Like, yeah, it's just 
you, you have no control over it. And it is. Yeah. It, so it is a little bit more of a scary thing there. Obviously, it's super, super uncommon, yeah. like entirely. It's mm. not something you should be staying up at night about. But yeah, and I mean, kind of bringing it back to the true crime people. I mean, Noah, you said there that, you know, they when it's serial killers, they, they wouldn't necessarily give all the victims the respect they deserve. But no. like, that's assuming that these people that sort of do true crime do give... <laughs> any respect to the victims at all. Yeah. I mean, and I think this is important to talk about, right? I mean, I kind of wanted to bring this up during, you know, during this episode because I tried to look into the sort of parasocial relationships that surround serial killers because yes, people have parasocial relationships with serial killers. Yeah, of of course. course they do. You're not going to make a Jeffrey Dahmer show where you've got a, a stone cold hottie playing uh, playing Evan Jeffrey Peters, Dahmer. Evan Peters and like Zac Efron. Yeah. And why like... <laughs> Why are you casting leading men to play these roles? Why are they so charismatic? Why is that the story that we're told? Oh yeah, serial killers are charismatic men that use their charming good looks and whatnot. No, they're not. Not in all cases. Sometimes they're just a dude who is getting away with a lot of murders. Okay? Sensationalizing this, romanticizing this, having a parasocial relationship with someone who just kills people is so, so messed up. And honestly, true crime absolutely plays into that oh, in a lot of ways because it, it sensationalizes it romanticizes to some extent um, it, and it also desensitizes people to these crimes yeah one thing I'll say about true crime I'm going on a, a, a mini rant here we'll be done in just a sec I'm sorry everyone one thing about true crime is either change your name to murder porn or something similar <laughs> that makes it very clear that you don't actually care about crime, you just care about talking about gruesome, grisly murders, Yeah. or start covering other crimes. Because, hey, there are interesting crimes. I want to hear about fraud. I want to hear about identity theft. I want to um. hear about bank robberies. All of those <laughs> things are really bloody interesting. Why is it always murders with you people? It's because you have some sick obsession with murder. Oh, my God. Do you know what I can smell right now? The comments of people being like, well, actually, true crime can be really helpful for solving mysteries because um, actually putting out all this information into the world means that the normal people, the power will be put into their hands and then they'll solve the crimes. And also they're respecting the victims. Yeah, sure. I love un- <laughs> I love unqualified people who don't understand the first thing about forensics, yeah. thinking that they are actually making any changes when they read something from Murderpedia. Yeah. I love it <laughs> when white women talk about, the, talk about the trauma of people of marginalized identities yeah. for fun. Yeah. And before you try and point out the one or two true crime people that you know that aren't white women most of them are white women (laughs) okay and that's not that's not an insult to white women in general I'm just saying that maybe it's a bit weird that (laughs) that this group of white people are focusing quite heavily on the trauma of a group that they don't necessarily exactly belong to yeah especially like the Jeffrey Dahmer stuff like people really gloss over the fact that like the majority of his victims were like young black men Oh, yeah. gay black men. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. yeah, so true crime, I mean, I, look, it, it definitely, I think, you can you can see how it plays in to a lot of this sort of serial killer stuff, especially just through the sort of desensitization, yeah. right? And, I mean, we talk about parasocial relationships. We've done an episode on parasocial relationships with Shaba, which was absolutely fantastic. Was One of my good. favorite episodes that yeah. we've ever done. And, you know, we can we could talk for, for days genuinely about parasocial relationships because I don't think we, we consider how much they influence our lives because yeah. you have a parasocial relationship with Ted Bundy. You have a parasocial relationship with Jeffrey Dahmer. I have a parasocial relationship with the bloody Zodiac Killer because Zodiac is one of my favorite films and I think it's I, like I think that whole concept is very interesting despite the fact that it's a horrific series of murders, right? Yeah. Like, my point here is that we need to be maybe a little bit more careful, a little bit more conscious and a little bit more cautious about the way that our brains will sort of attach themselves to or, or sort of create relationships with people that we interact with in the media, yeah. right? Whether those people be real people, fictional people, serial killers, or anything else. If you if you see someone on a screen or if you read about someone or if any if anything like that happens, you're gonna start a little relationship in your head with them. And you need to be on top of that. Because yes, being a crazy fan who thinks they're best friends with Dan and Phil, when in actuality they've never met them and Dan and Phil do not know or care about who they are, is one thing, but being someone who has a weird obsession with serial killers and murderers and thinks that it's all right because it's quirky and kooky and they know that these that these things are horrible and oh, look how desensitized I am, that is, 
as bad, if not much, much worse. Yeah, I feel like people just need to be a bit more self-aware about why they're consuming the content that they consume. Because mm. if they want, if they want to watch true crime, like fine, like go ahead. But my issue with it is just people being like, "Oh no, I'm doing it for this reason. I'm doing it for this reason," and it's actually fine. It's like it's not, mm. but like. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, ethical true crime, sure. Yeah. I mean, if there's consent from the families, if they're involved in it, sure. Yeah. I, but that's something you rarely find from podcasts and and YouTube because they're <laughs> yeah. taking it from they're taking it from other sources. It's hard to do that properly when you're doing a brand deal. Oh no, exactly. Especially like it's hard to do that properly when you're selling murder merch, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have you have a very not a very unique experience, but you have a very uncommon experience of being someone who is very closely related to a story that yeah. is covered on true crime things. I mean, would you like to use this platform? Would you like to stand up on your soapbox and say know. how you feel about that specifically? It's just weird. Like, cause I remember, I remember like, obviously I remember when my cousin died, like she was mm. like murdered and it was bad and it was like on the radio. It's a horrible murder, for, like, yeah. For like weeks and weeks and weeks. And like, it's just weird, like seeing that in an episode because like, that's like my family. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember like how my cousins reacted to it and like how my dad reacted to it. And I remember going to the funeral and all mm. that stuff. And it's like such a personal thing. And for people to be making just like, yeah, it's just like murder porn. And it's always quite lighthearted as well. It's very detached. Yeah, right? it's very detached. It's weird. They don't see these people as people. They just see them as like cool little data points and like little stories. I understand the sort of need to sort of lighten the tone because it is horrible. Yeah. Whenever we talk about really heavy stuff on this podcast, we do try and lighten it a bit. Yeah. But the difference between, I think the difference between us covering, say, you know, the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or covering any other number of horrible things that have happened to people throughout history, um, you know, in the name of science, is that we're not covering it because we enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> we're not, we're not, we cover so many different stories and sometimes we take on these really difficult ones because it's very important for you to know those. Is it important for you to know about every single murder that's happened in the past 50 years? Mm. I don't think so. <laughs> it's also very unlikely that somebody would listen to an episode about the Tuskegee syphilis experiment and then be like, ooh, I want to be an irresponsible scientist. Exactly. Whereas <laughs> people covering terrorist attacks and mass shooting attacks and mm. probably serial killings inspires other ones because they're so venerated mm. and so admired. Like, exactly. We're not going to do that. Unless, I mean, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to cover a story from the 1940s about an irresponsible uh, scientist and then some Scientist somewhere goes. I want to do bad science now. No, I think, and yeah, I then think I'll the, be on side guys. <laughs> no, like, exactly. Like the, the humor, uh, like the sort of levity that we bring to this is always with a tone of this thing is bad. Like we always, like we always make sure that that is the that that is the core thing there. And I don't know. I just think that when it comes to true crime, it's really hard to separate it from talking about you know um, serial killers and the psychology surrounding that because. You're just desensitizing yourself to these awful things for n no apparent reason. Yeah. And like, look, I mean, I will ask you this one last thing on true crime, Noah. Yeah. And you don't need to answer it, but if you do, it'd be fantastic. Right. If you could look to the camera here and just maybe say any message that, that you want to anyone who's thinking about doing <laughs> true crime videos as someone who is very much directly related to one of those stories. Maybe don't do that. <laughs> maybe don't do that. Like even, oh God, I don't remember what it was. I saw this tweet like a year ago and it was a brand deal from some true crime YouTuber or podcaster or whatever. And they, they posted a tweet and they were like, here's the here's the murder of this guy that was murdered a year ago. Get like 15% off for this thing. And it's like, you are so, so desensitized to that. It's insane. And but you yeah. can buy your Psy Guys branded daggers at psyguys.co.uk. <laughs> right? UK. right? Yeah. Like seriously, I'm, I swear to God, imagine if we started selling merch that was related to this to yeah. Skiggy Syphilis Experiment <laughs> or Eugenics. Oh, little Eugenics. Oh, I survived Eugenics pin badges. Like, that is horrific. Think about what you're doing. You are la you lack so much yeah. empathy and you're spreading that to your audience. I also, I just think it's worth saying that like, there is value in learning about like, the, the psychology of why people tend to do things that they do, but that's not the same as there being value in like getting into the grisly details of how somebody was murdered. Because yeah. that's 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 what true crime is about. It's not like, oh, here are the internal thought processes of this psychopath, and this is where it comes from, and here are studies about it. It's literally just like, here's what this guy did. He stabbed the hell out of someone, and then he buried them, and then he dug oh, them up. It's a lot more porny than that. Yeah, it's, Look, it's I would, way worse. And then he ripped yeah. this bit of... Uh, yeah, and there's like dramatic music in the background, and I'm just like, that is somebody's 
family. Yeah, that's someone's mother, father, son, daughter, sibling. And you know what I mean? Like it is, it's someone that someone is related to, that someone knows. It was someone's friend. They had a whole life. Yeah. And instead of focusing on maybe the how, for example, of how someone was caught, or the yeah. why, for example, of why someone would be led to do this, you focus on the what. Yeah. <laughs> You're only focusing on the what. We don't focus on the what when yeah. we cover these things, right? And like. You might be wondering, oh, Corey, this is an episode on serial killers, the science of serial killers. Why are you spending so much time talking about true crime? Why are you spending so much time not talking about the psychology of serial killers? Because I want this episode to be about the psychology of serial killers and also about maybe the psychology behind why people really, really want to see an episode on the psychology mm. of serial killers. Yeah, you, you you weirdos voted this one in. <laughs> Look, our patrons our patrons are great. No, our patrons are absolutely fantastic. But what I'm what I will say what I will say is that this show we're I I wouldn't say that we're afraid to have difficult conversations or say things that might make you uncomfortable to think about or, you know, contend with. And I will say to our audience, to our patrons maybe consider why it is that you want to understand um, why it is you want to see an episode on serial killers, right? Why you want to see us delve into that topic. Is it because you want to understand this weird quirk of humanity more deeply? I think probably, yeah. Maybe, <laughs> but is it also because you've been somewhat desensitized to the concept of serial killing, you think it's a much more common thing than it is and you want to understand it on some weird macabre sort of, you know, like, vis Visceral level, kinky level. Well, not kinky, <laughs> um, but I mean, like there is, there is like a sort of almost like it, it is this very sick thing, but there is some kind of pleasure in trying to understand that. And yeah, that's all I'll say. That like, consider why you engage with the content that you engage with. If you're into true crime, ask yourself why. Ask yourself what it's adding to the world. Ask yourself what you're actually getting from it. Yeah. And I guess that is the episode on serial killers. There's some other things I've got there about female serial killers. I, we could do maybe a whole bonus episode on this one paper that I found that looks at the sort of behavior sequence analysis of serial killers' lives. It looks from childhood abuse up to methods of murder. Mm. Um, and we can we can do a bonus episode on that. Sure, we can look into that sort of psychology. But for an episode that's going out to everyone, yeah, we can touch a little bit on the psychology of it. But let's touch on the psychology of the people that are interested in serial killers too because that is far more interesting yeah. and I think far more relevant and important than looking at the very small number of the population that are serial killers. Yeah. Well with that there is only one thing left I think maybe it's a quick fire quiz. <gasps> wow. Dun 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 serial killer edition. Deary me. Well the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. I'll ask one question that's one question between the two of you. The first person to buzz in with the correct answer wins. What do they win Luke? A guest spot on a true crime podcast. <laughs> Surely that should go to the loser. Anyway <laughs> Luke what is your buzzer? Oh dear uh, let's be sensitive here um, Ooh. Noah what is your buzzer? Ah always Very good. Okay so my question for you both today is what does ASPD stand for? Ooh. <laughs> that was such a faint ah. Look, That's because no I heard him say it already. <laughs> Anti-social personality disorder. Ding, ding, ding. That is correct, Noah. That means, unfortunately, you will have to guest on a true crime <laughs> podcast. I don't make the rules. Blame Luke. But thank you for joining us. And I think we need to say thank you to some patrons. Would you like to join in with that, Noah? Sure. I really yeah. hope there's somebody who runs a true crime podcast watching. Uh, <laughs> we'll offer Noah up if you'd like him as a guest. I will he will just... criticise what you do the entire time. Uh, yeah. Yes, I would just stare at you the entire time and think, hmm. You'll also make recording quite difficult. Yeah. <laughs> the amount of coughs we've had to edit out of this a, episode. Hey, hey, hey. I love that you're using we. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. <laughs> well then, let's get started. So, thank you to Ellie. Thank you, Samia McQueen. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Karen Elfwing. Thank you, Amelia Blake. Thank you, Nez. Thank you, Chelsea Lynn. Thank you, Devin Malsum. Thank you, Sia Riley. Thank you, Ian Altenor. Thank you, Crimson Foster. Thank you, Leilani Neves. Thank you, Carlin Sabrecht. Thank you, Asylum. Thank you, Lucy Blades. Thank you, T. Quinn. Thank you, Noe, pronounced like Joey, but with an N. Thank you, Natalia the Weirdo. Thank you, Jack is here. Where is he? Oh, no. Or she or they. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Huckagay underscore. Thank you, Rosie Dickinson. Thank you, Noosh or Nush 
or whatever other vowel sound you can make. Nusch. <laughs> Thank you, Papa the Smurf. Thank you, Riley Johnson. Thank you, Danny Lee. Thank you, Heidi Brigadella. Thank you, Kira Hart. Thank you, Joy Draws. Thank you, Vin Shoken. Thank you, Clay. And finally, thank you, Tyler Lachance. Wow, a whole wow. bunch of patrons hey, to end the year. Thank you. Big old round of applause for you all. This is the last patron vote episode of the year, but we've got a whole bunch of new ones coming for you next year. So if you want to be involved in the episodes that we do for Sci Guys, go ahead and join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Sci Guys. We're going to be redoing it a little bit. We're going to be adding a few tiers. We're going to be making Ooh. some changes Ooh. in the new year. So you want to get involved and make sure you're there for that because, oh boy, there's a bunch of good surprises for you. But I think that's it from us. Thank you for joining us, Noah. Everyone, right. go ahead and listen to Noah's music do if it. you want. Also, Noah and I have done a little cover that's going to be coming out in a few days. It's for charity. So if you want to go and watch that, head to my channel at youtube.com forward slash not Corey. But that is it from us. Before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons with an extra special thank you to executive producers Danito and Glitch Rabbit. And thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode down in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod at patreon.com forward slash sly guys or you can find a contact as a sly guys pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and and at SciGuys on TikTok too. <sighs> or you can send us an email at SciGuysPod at gmail.com. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod. At gmail.com. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. You can follow me at No Offense everywhere, apart from TikTok where it's the No Offense and Twitter where it's No Offense Adams. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.